Hello, I'm John Molesky, and this is Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Today, we introduce you to part one of a two-part series where we visit with some recent Kennan scholars to talk about their work. Joining us this week, Jonathan Brunstead. Jonathan is an assistant professor of history at Texas A&M University and a former Title VIII research scholar with the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute. We'll speak with him about his Wilson project titled Entangled Defeats the Soviet-Afghan War and the Shadow of Vietnam, and also about his book, The Soviet Myth of World War II, Patriotic Memory and the Russian Question in the USSR. A bit of a preview, the works are not unrelated. Jonathan, welcome back to the Wilson Center virtually. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. So I, I wanna ask you first um, about your early influences. I have the advantage of seeing an interview that you did while at the Wilson Center, and you, you talked about some, um, some fascinating, at least I thought so, uh, ideas about how you came to your your professional focus. Can you share that with our viewers? Sure. Well, I grew up, uh, well, I came of age, I guess, in the 1980s during the Cold War. Uh, a lot of my earliest memories are centered around the Cold War. You know, Reagan's uh, evil empire speech, the Chernobyl disaster, the collapse of the Soviet Union. These are some of my really indelible first memories. Culturally, I was shaped by the uh, culture of the the, Ameri the Cold War in the United States. Uh, I mentioned in that interview, for example, the the, the action 80s, 1984 film uh, uh, Red Dawn, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of a, almost a cartoonish film about high school students in a Colorado mountain town who take to the hills and go to war with the invading Soviets and, and, and Cubans in, in, in Colorado. And I actually grew up in a town very similar to that. It was a small mountain town in northern Arizona. And I show my students this film and they're like, is this, you know, it's, it's so cartoonish. Who would ever take this seriously? Growing up, this film, I, I can attest that it, I, we, people my age took it very seriously. We, we considered the Soviet Union uh, an existential threat to the United States, even during the, the 1980s. Uh, and there was nothing more to the story than that. Uh, and it wasn't until I got to late in high school and college that these Cold War perceptions were really challenged uh, when I studied these things in any depth. And uh, I initially was an ancient uh, historian uh, as an undergraduate. I loved the ancient Mediterranean, and that's actually a little connected to my to my first book project. Uh, but I took a great several great courses at, at UCLA where I did my undergraduate in Soviet history, Eastern European history, and 20th century history. And it wasn't until that point that I, I really recognized how shaped by the Cold War I was. And I embraced uh, Soviet Russian 20th century history in graduate school in part because this subject really challenged my longstanding Cold War perceptions. And it, th these perceptions, by the way, I should say, I, I see them uh, perpetrated and uh, reproduced in my, my students to this day. Uh, so these Cold War perceptions really are, are uh, uh, quite lasting in our society, and they inform an important strain of, of political thought in the United States as well. I share your perspective as far as coming of age politically and, and the Cold War paradigm as being the dominant one that I, that I grew up in. And your story, no pun intended, speaks to the power of stories. I, I just saw some recent research, really fascinating, that said when people were asked if there was something they saw in media, any kind of media that traumatized them, that caused them nightmares or sleepless nights, 91% of respondents chose a work of fiction, a movie or a book or something like that. So what, what the, the study concluded is that even not just watching say coverage of 9-11 attacks, but watching a movie like Red Dawn can have such a lasting impact even though you know logically that it's a work of fiction and yet the power of story is such that it has a lasting impression in your case yeah, that, your career well, yeah, in response to that yeah that, there's uh, another example of this not just red dawn that actually made an impact on on ronald reagan uh and that was the tv movie uh the day after uh, mm -hmm. about a, a, a nuclear uh war between the united states and soviet union i saw this movie when i was like seven years old and uh, it, it, again, to me, yeah, it was a fictional narrative, but it was framed in a way that this is something that could possibly happen. And it was so realistic, even as a child, of course, it was, it was probably very traumatizing to me at the time, yes. although I didn't recognize that. It even, it influenced Ronald Reagan, you know, the, the president of the United States who, 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 who uh, you know, shared these, these fears. 
Yeah, then famously uh, uh, proposed to Gorbachev at Reykjavik, the elimination of all nuclear weapons as a result of what an impact it had on him. So <laughs> right. the, the, the myth that you reference in, in your book, the first book, uh, what is the myth that you're referencing? Yeah, so, well, first I should say something about that, that term myth. Uh, I don't mean myth in the sense of a sort of fake narrative uh, or, or uh, deception or anything like that. I, I don't mean to imply that with myth. I use myth more in a sociological sense to mean a, a narrative that has an identity shaping quality to it. Uh, it's, it, it sustains you know, what scholars call uh, historical memory, cultural memory, things like this, uh, which is distinct from actual history. Uh, memory is, I would argue, plays a much more, and, and myths which sustain them, these narratives, uh, play a much more outsized role in shaping public attitudes and perceptions about the past. Uh, it's less about what actually happened. You know, historians try to figure out what actually happened, you know, imperfectly, but they rely on sources to, to recreate what actually happened. Uh, collective memory and the myths that sustain them, it's more of a shared body of beliefs about the past. Uh, um, and these have a, a you know, shape people's understanding of the past, uh, the present, and by implication, the future, uh, to quote uh, the historian John, John Bodnar. Uh, and I, I could just give some example, uh, an example that I use to my students to, to distinguish myth from memory, uh, uh, or excuse me, uh, memory from history. Well, I ask them, you know, for example, I, I teach World War II, and I ask them, you know, close your eyes, imagine the June 1944 uh, landings on uh, the beaches at Normandy. And what every one of them say, what do, you, what do you picture? And they all picture Tom Hanks uh, because of Saving Private Ryan. Uh, another example of this, if you think about Washington crossing the Delaware, uh, everyone imagines this, this famous painting uh, of Washington crossing the Delaware. In fact, that painting was you know, uh, 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 painted after the 1848 revolutions in Europe as, a, as an homage to uh, uh, liberal, liberal values and those liberal revolutions that were taking place. Uh, historically, it's, all, it's completely problematic, but in our collective imagination, uh, uh, we, we embrace that. It's much more meaningful uh, than I would say the academic uh, 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 study of, of the past. You know, the great mythologist Joseph Campbell would always make the distinction you just did and say that in common usage, we equate myth with lie. And he says myths are actually stories that even if not 100% factually accurate, often reveal greater truths than the facts themselves. Absolutely. And I, I say that myths, in the case that I'm using, in the sense that I'm using them, they're neither good nor bad. It depends on how they're using. I mean, I could I could talk about you know I've got my own myths that that shape my life. I talk about the myth of how I met my wife. Yes. Uh, you know, and if I and it's very subjective. So if I look back and try to analyze it, I can't because it's so romanticized. You know, I can't see it clearly as this historical event that happened. I I buy into this myth that it was this great romance. You know, when in reality, if someone else was to look at it objectively, it would probably be very distinct from what actually happened. Maybe you should bring your wife on for a, a contrasting opinion. On that. Oh, yeah. I hope she never sees this interview now. I, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and, and then the myth of World War II in the Soviet Union then shapes this notion of, of patriotism, USSR style. What, what is that? How, how would you define that? What would be, especially for an audience that might see patriotism through their own lens, how is it different or the same in the, uh, the Soviet context? In the Soviet Union, you know, everywhere it's it's complicated, right? In the Soviet yes. Union, it's extremely complicated, and it's complicated in part by the vastly multi-ethnic uh, 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 country that the Soviet Union was. And on top of that, it was a socialist country. It was a revolutionary country that ostensibly uh, rejected the Ancien Regime uh, and aspects of pre-revolutionary Russia, as, as, you know, as, as it existed. At the same time, uh, Russian national patriotism was very important uh, beginning in the 1930s under Stalin, who saw this as a kind of glue to hold society together. Uh, of course, uh, as other scholars have noted, this, this sort of Russian quasi-nationalism in the Soviet Union was used to convey Marxist ideals, but it was received very often in a more Russian nationalistic sense. Now, when, where the, how the war plays into this, uh, I think most scholars up to this point have seen World War II as reinforcing uh, this Russian-centered or Russo-centric basis of Soviet multi-ethnic governance and Soviet mobilization, right? 
The Russian people led this multi-ethnic society in World War II. Uh, hence, uh, you know, and and they they rooted this, by the way, in their pre-revolutionary military triumphs and things like this. So there was this Russo-centric and Russo-centrism uh, uh, that was connected to the war. That's uh, and Stalin gave a famous speech in, in on May twenty fourth, nineteen forty five, in which he you know explicitly declared that the uh, Russian people are, are are the you know the the the, the nation that led uh, the Soviet victory. That up to this point has been how most historians have interpreted the remembrance of World War II, the commemoration of it. And you know, even in the post-Stalin period, people talk about how this kind of reinforced uh, Russo-centrism in the Soviet Union. I sort of challenged that view, and I argue that in fact it was it was more complicated than this. Uh, uh, the, the 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 Russian Russo-centric aspects of the war competed, even during the war itself, competed with what I call an internationalist variation on the war's memory, which saw a more lateral, a laterally configured uh, 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 multi-ethnic population, the Soviet people or the Sovietsky Narod. Now these two narratives competed with each other under Stalin. When Stalin dies and his, his uh, Stalinism is, and his cult of personality are, are, are denounced under, under Khrushchev, uh, well, a lot of his Russo-centric statements, you know, during the war, he hearkened back to uh, Alexander Nevsky and these sort of Russian and proto-Russian uh, he heroic figures. Uh, uh, but during de-Stalinization, these Russo-centric tropes were really closely affiliated with Stalin's cult. And so they couldn't uh, 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 remain part of the Soviet Union's mobilizational repertoire. So these were actually downplayed uh, in from the 1950s uh, uh, and, and, and 60s and into this expansion of the war's memory after 1965 with the 20th anniversary of Victory Day. They couldn't continue to embrace this Russo-centric ideal. They pushed it kind of below the surface. Uh, they, they emphasized people could have the cultural preservation movements, for example, in the Soviet Union were free to celebrate Russian national history and things like this, but they were prevented from uh, sort of yoking the victory in the war, which is now presented as an internationalist or pan-Soviet event uh, uh, with these pre-revolutionary Russian or Russo-centric tropes. Uh, so it's very complicated. I, I, I recognize that, but but you know, like in all societies, you have this tension between different versions of the war's memory. Well, well, part of what you describe also describes the way that a country will pick and choose the myths or the stories that it focuses on as a way to fuel uh, public opinion around contemporary issues or decisions. So fast forwarding to today in the post-Soviet world, uh, how much of this mythology, how much of this storytelling, how much of this notion of, of Russian exceptionalism still exists and is used as a tool by Vladimir Putin and others today? One of the Vladimir Putin's uh, big projects, of course, has been you know, restoring the World War II victory as a central uh, myth of the fledgling Russian Federation you know, uh, in the sort of post-millennial era. Now, I chart, the reason it's so popular in large part is because of Soviet era myth-making. Uh, in addition to the very real sacrifice that Soviet citizens made during the war, you know, this, this is a very uh, a, a real uh, uh, thing. And it's no wonder that it's so near and dear to so many Russian people today or people in the, the post-Soviet space. So I, I would argue that that you know the Russian government's attempt to sort of resurrect a kind of World War II centered narrative as a basis for post-Soviet Russian identity dates to the Soviet era. At the same time, uh, I would argue, and this ties in more directly to my argument, uh, you know, Putin or, or the, the Russian government, current present day Russian myth makers are still negotiating these very same tensions that were present in the Soviet era. How do you? you know, rally a whole society, a vastly multi-ethnic society that you're calling Russian, you know, in a sort of civic uh, territorial mm -hmm. sense, how do you rally this multi-ethnic society around uh, a narrative of World War II that's very Russian-centered? Putin famously argued that, you know, we need to argue that, or we need to sort of show that Russian identity, identity didn't begin with 1917, it didn't begin with 1917, but there, uh, excuse me, 1991, but there's a whole thousand year history of Russian history that, that we need to look back and embrace. So one of Putin's projects has been, has been connecting that thousand year history with uh, great Soviet era achievements, mainly victory in the war, the revolution is a completely another issue, uh, and how to sort of make this into a, a linear narrative of, of Russian greatness. However, he's encountering problems that Soviet leaders encountered as well. 
I'm dealing with, we're dealing with a multi-ethnic society. This Russo-centric narrative doesn't appeal to everybody. Uh, also, the Russian narrative, as it's, you know, one scholar, Gregory Carlton, has called it a kind of civic religion of, of modern, uh, modern day Russian nationhood, now, in part because there's very little else that, from the Soviet era at least, that uh, political leaders are willing to embrace. Uh, but by embracing the war so heavily, it's created these other challenges. Namely, how do we negotiate that this was a, first of all, a, a, a communist thing, right? Uh, uh, that it was uh, officially celebrated in the Soviet era as uh, connected to the revolution, to Stalin, to Stalin himself, uh, to Soviet modernization and these things. How do we sort of overlook that or balance that, juggle that with this thousand year Russian martial pedigree that we're trying to do? Uh, these tensions and contradictions were present in the Soviet era. And I would argue they, they remain present in post-Soviet Russian attempts to uh, unify Russian society around uh, the World War II victory. I'm gonna make a, an inelegant pivot to your most recent Wilson project, Entangled Defeats. Uh, where you talk about how we use and abuse historical analogies. You know, I, I often think of that in terms of any scandal in the United States for decades had a gate attached to it in the, in the aftermath of Watergate. They just right. don't go away. And, and in some cases, they're very useful in helping someone understand what's happening. In other cases, they become distortions. What's the, the scenario when it comes to Russian involvement in Afghanistan? Does it help us understand or is it a distortion? That's a good question. Uh, it's something I'm trying to answer. Uh, just for some context, I, I look at the way, you know, there's a, almost a cliche in the West that, that Afghanistan represented the Soviet Union's Vietnam. And so I look specifically at this Soviet Vietnam narrative as it emerged in the 1980s. In fact, uh, uh, it even predates the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. You, you have uh, huge debates in, in 1979, you know, the Soviets invaded in December, 1979, but throughout the entire year of 1979 as the fledgling regime, communist regime in Afghanistan uh, uh, was uh, sort of racked by a, 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 a backlash from the communist takeover, uh, you have debates globally around the world uh, uh, about whether or not the Soviet Union would intervene and whether or not this would become the Soviet Union's Vietnam. Keep in mind, this is just a few years after the, after the, the formal ending of the war uh, in, in Vietnam. And so what you have here is uh, uh, people on both sides of the Iron Curtain. So I should say in the United States, the Soviet Vietnam narrative was very important also. In the late 1970s, the United States was embroiled, was kind of, uh, uh, there was a widespread aversion to foreign interventions. This is sometimes known as the Vietnam syndrome. Well, in the, in the you have uh, Carter's National Security Advisors, Big Nip Brzezinski, uh, writing in the first days after the war that, you know, is this going to be a Soviet Vietnam? Well, it doesn't look like it. We need to support the local Mujahideen so it becomes a Soviet Vietnam. So you have Vietnam as kind of a touchstone on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Uh, in the United States, they wanted to bring about a Vietnam-like quagmire for the Soviet Union, at least in the first years, and this picks up after Reagan. In the Soviet Union, uh, remember, they they heavily, that they, they looked at Vietnam as a great victory for the communist world. Uh, however, uh, people started making these comparisons and they were very sensitive to this. So they actively promote a campaign to downplay this comparison between Vietnam and the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Uh, but the larger point here is that Vietnam, the Vietnam, the American war in Vietnam was becoming this touchstone that both sides of the Iron Curtain were recognizing, uh, you know, the, the, this potential outcome in the Soviet war in Afghanistan. In the United States, uh, this connection enables the United States to sort of overcome this Vietnam syndrome. And I would argue in part because the Soviet Afghan war, it was increasingly portrayed as the Soviet Union's Vietnam. They're saying, oh, look, our superpower power rival is embroiled in their own Vietnam, whereas we were supporting the local resistance fighters against this great superpower imperialist aggressor, right? Which is the exact same rhetoric uh, that the Soviet Union was employing against the United States during the Vietnam War. And so this plays an important role in the United States as well. In the Soviet Union, you have Soviet citizens actually drawing on uh, this, the USSR's own official rhetoric about the Vietnam War, and they apply these sorts of insights to their own war in Afghanistan in diaries and memoirs and things like this. Now, officially, this was really scary for the Communist Party. In fact, the last official statement of the uh, Defense Ministry, which was issued on February 14th, 1989, to the UN uh, mission in Afghanistan, specifically outlined why this 
event should not be remembered as the Soviet Union's Vietnam. And they point out differences. I mean, that's how that's how uh, uh, anxious the leadership was. Uh, I, does this, does this that work? Does that work, Jonathan, in the sense that, you know, there's a conventional wisdom in, in politics that when you repeat the other side's criticisms of you, all you do is uh, solidify those notions in people's brains by objecting publicly and by trying to make a distinction between U.S. involvement in Vietnam and Soviet involvement in, in Afghanistan. Did they just drive the point home uh, in, a, in a more pronounced way? This happened in, in a lot of respects. And, and to some extent, it depends on you know, the, the, who we're talking about in, in, in Soviet society. Uh, there were many political elites who I have you know, their diary entries talking about, oh, we are, this is definitely just like Vietnam. On the other, you have a variety of perspectives though. And you have some actually very thoughtful views expressed by regular Soviet citizens who are saying, you know, there are major differences here. For example, uh, Vietnam and the United States, they don't border each other. Afghanistan borders the Soviet Union. This is one major difference that, that a lot of Soviet citizens pointed out. And so you see a really thoughtful negotiation about the meaning of Vietnam. And this, uh, you know, I, I think was a catalyst for thoughtful reflection on the Soviet involvement in Afghanistan. Officially though, this stuff was all suppressed. It was only after 1989, after 1991, especially where you, you get a much more frank, uh, you, you actually have an explosion of, 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 of agreement that this was our Vietnam among a, a lot of people. But I wanna say there was a huge diversity of opinion within the Soviet Union regarding whether or not this was the Vietnam. The point is Vietnam was the touchstone. Uh, and so whether or not it was like Vietnam uh, varied depending on who you asked. Is there a better way uh, it, or is it just human nature that we're going to make these comparisons and we're going to draw analogies from the past? But when you think in terms of the, the larger themes that you've uncovered, historical memory and, and how we not only remember things, but then carry them forward and they define us in identity. Is there a better way or is this just completely unavoidable? I would say making analogies is almost unavoidable. Uh, what's not avoid avoidable is using historical analogies in an informed manner, uh, in, a, in a very careful, thoughtful manner. Uh, you know, I, I have my doubts about whether or not that, that is the way analogies can, you know, governments, for example, or politicians will ever use analogies. Uh, but I, I do feel strongly that historical analogies, it, it, you know, analogizing, this is the way you make sense of the present. You know, I, I would argue it's a fundamental aspect of, of human societies, making sense of the present by trying to find some reference point in, 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 in the past. You know, the, how do you know what this thing is? Well, it's, it's like this or that thing uh, that we've experienced in the past. This is a very, I, I think, uh, innate uh, uh, social uh, uh, process. And, and this is going to be a book as well, is that correct? Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, what's, the, what's the update on the, the timeline? I know authors hate that question. <laughs> well, I'm yeah. Oh, you know, I'm currently going up for tenure right now. And so I, I, uh, uh, I'm hesitant to give a precise date, but this is my second book project. And I would say it's, it's uh, still a couple of years off, but I hope to have uh, some articles uh, that I actually prepared while I was at the, the Wilson Center, uh, uh, you know, ready for publication within the next year or two. Uh, but this, yeah, th this book will be uh, 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 coming out eventually. Great. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for sharing your time with us today. Fascinating stuff, and we appreciate it. It was great having you at the center. It was a great pleasure. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center. Now and that you'll join us again next week for the second part of our two-part discussion with recent Kennedy Institute fellows. Until then, for all of us at the center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.